Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Harris Wellbeing Britain Bird Center third annual invited lecture. Great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Nigel, Nigel Simpson, great colleague and friend, and we collaborate a lot, and he helps us a lot, but we'll talk more about it. Just a few words of introduction. Nigel, our speaker today and learned guest, is actually from Glasgow, another Scottish obstetrician, uh, trained in St. Thomas's, and then I only found that found the uh, uh, little gem today that he spent training in Canada as a fetal medicine specialist and did a lot of work on monkeys and uh, apparently was a part of the team that first saw uh, early, how early uh, uh, placental circulation develops. And that is as early as what, six, seven weeks? Yes. Uh, yeah. And then he moved to Leeds where he spent, where he's currently working and um, has made his name particularly in, in a preterm birth, preterm birth prevention, and as an um, excellent surgeon, particularly in this area of survival self clash, that he will be telling us a bit about. Uh, he's also an NHR, National Institute for Health Research Lead for Reproductive Health, and the uh, chair of our preterm labor network. And as a clinician, I thought how best to introduce him. And then I thought I should probably quote a sentence from his email that he sent to the network three days ago. And it says, and this is Nigel coming to the temple of evidence-based medicine that is in Liverpool Women's Hospital. And this is what he says. When it comes to guidelines, I have found that the more time I spent in the clinic, preterm labor clinic that is, the less confidence I have in absolutes. Guidelines that are too hard edged tend to lead to less time listening to women and thinking about the reasons for various uh, clinical appearances and place more reliance on number based interventions and so on and so on. The point of this introduction that Nigel is championing individualized patient-centered approach, and this is what we see in our daily interactions with him when we talk about patients. But I'm sure that a lot of this is going to be covered in his um, annual lecture, Harvest lecture. So Nigel, please come and tell us the things that we do well and things that we don't do so well. Thank you very much, sir. Um, do you want me to quote your email or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. No. <laughs> so I'm just going to just adjust the light slightly. Sure, just help us. And uh, thank you. It's a great uh, honour and privilege to be before you today. Uh, and certainly, uh, having spent some time, I think every visitor to the women's spends some time in the antechamber up in the academic office, where you just realise actually what an intellectual pygmy you really are. <laughs> and then you can come down and sort of partake of the, the great event. But it was lovely to see the, the history of this great hospital and uh, that of uh, obstetric practice and gynae practice here in the care of women in, in Liverpool and how much it's impacted the world. Um, for those of you who are still training here, um, we who are leaving, probably within the next 10 years or so, leave you a great legacy of happy and healthy women in pregnancy. Um, and I say it's slightly tongue-in-cheek because, of course, nowadays the great problems that uh, were present in the mid to later half of, uh, of uh, the last century are now gone, those of maternal mortality. But what we bequeath to you, I'm afraid, um, has not altered one jot since we took the helm and will be very much uh, on your inbox when you come in. And that is the rather sobering truth that the major complications of pregnancy, uh, preterm birth, preeclampsia, small for gestational age, are, are still as prevalent as they were 
half a century ago. And furthermore, these are not rare events. Um, these are data from, uh, please see Louise Kenny here. Louise, one of the main drivers behind the scope uh, collaboration, where we actually forensically identified uh, and followed first-time mothers and found that these will complicate one in five pregnancies. So these are, these are times where, although we present, and I think we collude with women in the, the fantasy that pregnancy is a benign condition and everyone will be happy evermore. Actually, that is far from the truth, because there is a significant morbidity that will attend most women uh, at some stage uh, during pregnancy. And I think this is the next fantasy, is that actually preterm birth, if we take that, doesn't really matter because we've solved preterm birth. Uh, and I think, again, as obstetricians, we have deluded ourselves into thinking that the job is done with preterm birth and we need not worry about it anymore. The truth is that it is our neonatal colleagues, as we'll see in a moment, who are, we are most to thank for that. Uh, and at most to sort of uh, responsible for what we see to be very high survival rates uh, in, in, in extremely preterm babies. And this slide was taken from Leeds of Apple, this actually is about 20 years ago, where even the rate of severe morbidity was dropping dramatically. And so the impression you would get from that slide is that we've solved preterm birth. Uh, and I, I think it's time to disabuse ourselves of that notion because the public certainly don't think that preterm birth is a big deal. They are fed a constant diet, and this was a sort of blog of a 25 week of the Telegraph, and we have countless uh, demonstrations on television of brave little warriors who are, are very capably cared for and managed through the neonatal unit. And these documentaries will almost always finish with the happy family going home. And they do not explore what happens after that. And the sobering truth in terms of our obstetric care and what happened next is revealed in other data. This is the first evidence that we have to consider, and that's the dire state of UK practice in terms of our league table, in, uh, status in the league table of European neonatal mortality rates. Because you can see the UK is right at the bottom of that particular pile. We are worse than every other country in Europe when it comes to neonatal mortality. And the lion's share of that, well of course it comes through preterm birth and growth restriction, two of those factors that we read already about. And again, just in case we think we're getting quite good at this, here are even more sobering data. The latest uh, year for which we have statistics, 2016, records an even higher incidence of preterm birth and stillbirth within England and Wales. Our rates are going up exponentially. And although I've monkeyed around slightly with the, um, uh, the sharper, I don't know if Susan Ray will see that, on the y-axis, you wouldn't tell your students to do that soon, I know. Um, that rise of about 0.5% is about, uh, it works out at about 5,000 more babies a year being born preterm. It is not good. And really, because of that, there was uh, the, the ex Secretary of State for Health um, in uh, the monograph Safe and Maternal Care that was released last year, uh, made it quite clear that. In order to meet the maternity safety ambition, uh, we had to ensure that the rate of preterm births was reduced. And that is going to be a priority for uh, us in maternity, maternity care. Because this is what our neonatologists have done so far. And again, the feeling that the battle is over is very much carried by this side of the story, as you can see, that survival has increased year by year by Mark and his colleagues in the neonatal unit uh, to the extent that mortality in the neonatal unit is, is a relatively rare event. And prematurity is again perceived by parents and by the general public as not being that important. But it is not just a case of survival. It is survival uh, 
with as little morbidity as possible. And these MRs show that there is quite a lot of morbidity that can go on in a neonatal brain within the last trimester of pregnancy. So you see that, that at about 26 to 28 weeks, the brain is as smooth as a billiard ball. There are no sulci or gyri there. And over the following 14 weeks, what you see is an enormous proliferation and complexity uh, of, uh, that's just the, if you like, the external architecture that you see there. But within the brain itself, the connectivity, the neuronal connectivity, is taking place at a tremendous rate uh, over that period of time. And of course, it doesn't take too much, one would have imagined, to see that um, birth too soon would influence that rate of development or that uh, the, 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 the fidelity of, 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 of growth and development at that stage. And of course, we see that most strikingly, of course, when we see uh, babies who are born preterm come into our clinics with their mothers in the next pregnancy, and they just happen to be in a wheelchair, or they're wearing calipers. And that is, if you like, the expression of motor, uh, motor um, uh, uh, dysfunction that will accompany it, cerebral palsy. But it's not just cerebral palsy. If you look at cognitive function, for example, you can see here, uh, this is just a, a, a summary plot of the, the difference in IQ score with gestational age. And you can see the bubbles all represent separate, uh, separate studies with the size of the bubble corresponding to its weight. And what you can see here is that there is improvement in uh, IQ all the way up uh, to 35 weeks and beyond in other studies. So, being preterm means that you will have a, a, a lower educational attainment. And again, we feel as obstetricians that surely, as the pediatricians kindly sorted out mortality for us, surely they can do the decent thing and sort of fix everything after that as well. But the sobering truth again is that that simply doesn't happen. Um, here, I'm afraid, is a rather busy slide, but it's each individual um, uh, who participated or was followed in Epicure, and the team followed them over the following uh, almost 20 years. And you can see those lines are almost flat. You exit where you entered at. And if you look at what that looks like when it's boiled down, you can see that on the lower lines, you see uh, these are the epicure cohort here, and these are their term-born peers. The solid lines indicate households where uh, the mother uh, had uh, A-levels or, or a higher degree, and the dotted line where they did not attain that. And you can see even in well-educated households, there is still no catch-up that is expressed there. Your, your cognitive function will largely remain at the level at which you entered it. And that is a very sobering thought for obstetricians because actually the neonatologists and pediatricians, developmental pediatricians, have come as far as they can. And really the onus is on us <coughs> to be able to start to make differences in, in these sorts of statistics. <coughs> so we talked about motor outcomes, we talked about cognitive outcomes, and the third aspect is really to do with socialization. That's your ability to function within the community in which you grow up in. And here I'm afraid the story is no better because here is your likelihood of being diagnosed with uh, hyperkinetic disorder or if you like autism spectrum and you can see there that not unreasonably you would expect on the basis of what I said so far that you would quite a fair chance of that if you were born less than 34 weeks. But if you see there, the, the chances of you being diagnosed with one of these, these disorders remain elevated right up until about, uh, you know, until about 39, 40 weeks. So there is something inherently um, difficult uh, with being born preterm that we fail to realize 
because we only see that snapshot of nine months and we don't follow our patients up later. This was Gordon Smith's group who did a, a very elegant um, linked work uh, in Scotland where we can do that between maternity and neonatal data and pediatric databases and looked at your chances of requiring assistance in the classroom uh, put up against your gestational age at delivery. And again here, very clearly, this is a log scale on, on, on the y-axis, so the true proportion would be somewhere through the ceiling. Uh, you can see again, very high chance if you're born very preterm of requiring assistance in the classroom, but you can see these little Star Wars fighter pilots keep going all the way down, all the way down to 40, 41 years. So where are we now? Well, I think as I've said, um, there is no question that the most profound advances have been taken by the neonatologists. Um, the guys who always used to beat us at med school, yes? Um, you know, the ones in whom we always had that lingering suspicion that actually they, they just had a little bit more to them than we did. Well, it's true. They have come into the field and they have saved our bacon uh, more often than we like to think. And it's because of the profound ability of technology and uh, innovation that have come in there. And, and really, when you look at the list of things <coughs> we brought to the table, uh, I'm afraid it's not so impressive. Uh, because I can only think of really three things that are worth mentioning. And even then, I feel I have to bracket them for reasons that I'll explain. In the, probably the, the late 60s and 70s and 80s, we thought that this was going to be the solution. That to Colossus, if we actually arrested labor and were able to extend pregnancy for a couple more weeks, we would elevate our survival rates. Uh, and it seemed so plausible, didn't it? All our patients seemed to buy that as well. And we all congratulated each other when we managed to get another few days out of the situation. Uh, using whatever tocolytic. And as time goes by, we've used less and less um, attritional tocolytics so that women can tolerate them more and more. But sadly, as we've progressed in that department, we've realized on the other hand that actually buying time does not mean improving perinatal outcomes. And it was Mary Hanna's group who very uh, elegantly showed that in a meta-analysis uh, at the end of the 90s where they showed quite clearly that the use of tocolytics was very good at extending pregnancy, did that extremely well, but when you came to the main perinatal outcomes, actually, there was no benefit whatsoever. When we wanted steroids, and, uh, oh no, MagSelf to start off first of all. And again, we all think we're very clever with MagSelf, but actually, if it wasn't for these, um, neuroepidemiologists who worked with a group of very low birth weight babies in California and they happened to notice when they followed those babies and they tried to identify what was different in the antecedent history between those who developed cerebral palsy and those who had a normal outcome. They found that the babies who had been exposed to MagSelf for other obstetric indications as the Americans were using at the time for tocolysis were less likely to develop cerebral palsy. And really all the data from there, all the sort of developments from there, all precepts and everything, comes out of the work of a couple of the neuroepidemiologists, not the obstetricians. And even when we come to what we regard as the jewel and the crown, um, our use of antenatal glucocorticoids, even Mont Ligans, who was our guy, if you like, at the front, was gracious enough to acknowledge that it wasn't for the help of his um, neonatal co-author, Ross Harry, um, he wouldn't have got anywhere near the discoveries that now start the process of what we regard as the Cochrane collaboration later. So I'm afraid there's very little that we can bring to the table as genuine obstetricians, as something that is all our own. Uh, and I always have a sneaking feeling when I come onto the neonatal unit that um, I'm sort of regarded in these rather 
unfortunate terms, you know, looking for beds and basically not, not really up to much other than that. So it's with great pleasure that we can reflect on something in obstetric practice that will make a difference to prematurity, and that is the placement of a suture around the cervix, which we have to dress up a little bit and call a cerclage so that nobody really understands what we're talking about. <laughs> but in order to understand why cerclage could and is useful, it is something that we have to we have to consider the role of the cervix first of all before we move on to cerclage, and then we'll talk about the current issues. Because the cervix must be about the most underappreciated part of the body. I don't remember any lectures on the cervix whatsoever in my undergraduate teaching or indeed my postgraduate teaching. Uh, unless it had something to do with oncology. And if you go on the Amazon bookshop these days, I'm afraid it doesn't get any better. You have a variety of books which, which relate to par uh, patients' experiences, obviously of abnormal smears and what's going to happen uh, to them when they go to see the oncologist. Um, you have a number of rather regrettable books, which I'll spare you the details, but I'm <laughs> sure you can... Uh, Derive, even written by some of our colleagues themselves, this one on the right here, at your cervix. Uh, and indeed, there is actually only about one book that really one might feel some hope for. Oh no, that's, that's the midwifery book, uh, at your cervix, which is um, actually just a sort of a, a planner, I think. Uh, but this is the book that most of us will have come across perhaps once or twice or stumbled across it in the library. And that would be the book you would hope that would unpack what was relevant about this cervix in obstetric practice. Sadly, it was written, well, not sadly, it was very well written by Joe Jordan and Albert Singer. Uh, but sadly, out of the 26 chapters, only one chapter uh, has any relevance to obstetrics whatsoever. The rest is all about dysplasia and surgery and chemo or other things, gynae oncological. So there's very little out there to guide us if we have any interest in the cervix as to what it does. But you will remember, of course, in med school, um, some aspects which might prompt you as to the role of the cervix. And it is all to do with its mucus production. Now, you'll remember that that is principally from the columnar glands, and that in mid-cycle we see this phenomenon called spin barkite, where it becomes stringy, running and permits sperm access. And thereafter, uh, and this is something that we believe is secondary to the emergence of progesterone at that time, we see it changing its rheological uh, uh, qualities quite significantly to become quite tenacious and inelastic. And its purpose is very clear that once the sperm has gone in and once conception has taken place, no more is going to come into that uterus. The rampart is drawn up. And the plug that you can see there at the bottom is absolutely critical to ensuring that the lower pole of the uterus remains re relatively um, low in bacteria. It's not a sterile environment, um, but there is a relatively low bacterial load. And the reason for that is that mucus plug there. And that is critical to the maintenance of pregnancy. And uh, you can see it there, obviously. You can see it there in the middle there, identified uh, as a key part of, of, of uh, how the pregnancy is maintained. Now, if that does not occur, the consequence is microbial ingress. Uh, this is Bob Goldenberg's paradigm, which he presented about, again about 20 years ago, which is still very true today. So you have a relative abundance of bacteria within the uterine cavity, which can trigger an inflammatory response either within fetal or maternal tissues. And of course, that inflammatory cascade which then develops will precipitate delivery. And it's more than that because not only will it precipitate delivery, but the cytokines uh, and the other inflammatory mediators generated by that process will then go on and promote the adverse neonatal consequences that we so 
worry about, including um, uh, damage to white matter in the brain. So it is of imperative, uh, it is imperative that the cervix, through its two main qualities, its length and its strength, provides an effective barrier to the colonization of the nerve cells. And that really is all the cervix is there for. Towards the end of pregnancy, obviously, it is going to alter its function and become compliant and allow itself to be um, withdrawn and dilated to allow the baby to deliver. But this is its purpose here through its length and its strength. And we can see, uh, for example, if we start with its length, we can see that very easily demonstrated here on a transvaginal scan. It's a very simple procedure. It's rather, it's not a common practice in the UK, but it's very common in the, in, on the continent and in other countries. But it provides a very ready and simple way of assessing the length of the cervix. And this is it from the internal os to the external os. Uh, one can measure that length. And if one does so in the mid trimester, you see that. As with many other biologic variables, there is a normal distribution um, where the mean length is round about 38 to 40 millimeters and two standard deviations either side, bringing you down to 20 millimeters and 60 millimeters on the other side. And when we look at that same x, x axis and we plot on it uh, a different outcome, that is the risk of preterm birth, you see that as it shortens, as that barrier, that length, that closed length starts to narrow down or to draw down to below 20 millimeters, your chances of a preterm birth escalate exponentially. So there is a relationship between that mucus barrier and your likelihood of delivering a preterm. And unfortunately, we're pretty good at compromising the cervix, usually for beneficent reasons. But the principal way in which we, we the length of the cervix will be through excisional procedures, which are obviously designed to reduce the chance of a woman developing carcinoma of the cervix. And it's been known for some time now that if you carry out excisional procedures like <coughs> lexes, uh, if you these are just the aggregate uh, likelihoods, you can see that the relative risk is over one and a half times the risk. And if you look at the same figures for cone biopsies, which are necessarily uh, more extensive, uh, the, uh, the relative risk will go above two and a half. And there is an incremental element to it. Um, if you look at your chances of a preterm birth on the, on the y-axis and you look at the cone depth on the x-axis, you can see that the more you take away, the greater your chances are of having a preterm birth. And that's probably exemplified yeah, to its greatest extent when a woman has a trachelectomy uh, because not only have you removed uh, what was providing a degree of closed length, you also removed the mucus glands that were providing some protection against the ascent of colonizing bacteria. Um, so the strength of the cervix is the other um, key element of the cervix because if the cervix weakens and starts to open up, which it will typically do from the internal loss outwards, um, uh, you will start to reduce that length of closed cervix. And this is a phenomenon that occurs within the second trimester. So within the first trimester in the left panel, you can see that the natural uh, anti-flexion or retroflexion of the uterus will provide, if you like, a pinch cock to protect the cervix. And so we don't see elements of survival weakness within the first trimester. It is just not the case. It is not until the uterus becomes an abdominal organ, and you can see that process on the right at about 16 weeks, that it becomes axial in its configuration, and at that point you get the greatest pressure uh, at the internals. And that is the only way out for the pressure that's generated within the intrauterine. Cavity, and if the cervix is not strong enough, it will start to display that as it begins to weaken and open up. And again, 
We see that uh, further on in pregnancy, although beyond 26 weeks, the phenomenon is less pronounced, probably because any pressure that's generated within the uterus is distributed through the lower segment, which is beginning to emerge there. And so the, the role of the cervix is less critical from about 26 weeks on. Now, I say that as if, you know, we just made that up over the last few years, but actually it's been well recognized for many centuries uh, that this is the case. This is the, the, this remarkable book um, uh, by Culpepper, uh, although he was gracious enough, Culpepper, to recognize Dr. Reverius, who was uh, at the time the first uh, clinician to uh, recognize that the cervix had an occlusive function. And you can see there, if you can uh, read through the, the, the sort of the 17th <coughs> century English, um, that there is very clearly the sense in which a weakened cervix finds it difficult to maintain the pregnancy. Uh, and also the ways in which uh, previous events in, in a woman's life, say hard labor and childbirth, may ruin the ability of the cervix to maintain the pregnancy. Uh, and so this was well known to, to our forefathers, but there was relatively little that could be done about it. And I think very much the, 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 the insights gained by Riverius and others at Calcutta were largely lost, such that within the 19th century, we had a great, um, obviously, the, the ability to put women to sleep and do even more bizarre things to them meant that it allowed people great opportunities to uh, promote their own treatments for various afflictions, one of which was dysmenorrhea. And uh, our friend Dr. Marion Sims of Speculum's fame uh, felt uh, very strongly at that time that uh, to divide the uterus, in other words, to take a knife to the uterus and actually cut a chunk out of it, would relieve a woman of uh, painful periods. Um, now, its benefit in doing so, I think, was largely debated. I haven't seen any randomized trials of the procedure within the Lancet in that century. But one thing that Green noticed, and I do like the way in which discussions were, were, were conducted within the Lancet in those days. You'll see in his first paragraph there, he says, um, to which my attention has been drawn by many of my professional friends, but not in time to enable me to reply to them earlier, as if he had more pressing things to get on with than what Marion Sims had been up to. But he, he documents quite clearly that the women in whom this procedure was being <coughs> conducted, none of them seemed to be able to carry subsequently. None of them were able to, none of them were fertile after that operation. And he gives this example of the one exception that he mentioned, where the woman, when he, when he was asked to see her, he was able to, when he examined her, to put his finger right through the cervix and touch the gestational sac. And unsurprisingly, I don't think that it, it will come as any great shock to us who work in delivery suites these days, it was no surprise when several weeks later she delivered, obviously, much too early. And um, he says very sensibly that yeah, I need not say that the hopes of this patient are, are irreparably gone. So his caution was very much about dividing the cervix and ruining it. Unfortunately, Green's solution to dysmenorrhea was almost as bad, which was simply to dilate the cervix sufficiently. And unwittingly, he was probably promoting exactly the same outcome in them. So if we look at the strength of the cervix, if we look right at the beginning of the menstrual cycle, um, these, are, uh, work, uh, these are works by Asplund, who looked at the internal loss when uh, his team were carrying out hysterosalpingography. And what he noticed was that the internal loss would vary in its size, uh, its diameter, as the cycle proceeded. Uh, and again, it seems sensible to, to, to consider this because one would want naturally, uh, after, uh, after ovulation and presumably conception, you would want that, that entry into the uterus to be as narrow as possible, as well as your mucus plug to be as, uh, as inhospitable as possible. 
And indeed, uh, although he didn't make much of it at the time, when you, when you plot out his measurements of the measurements of the internal loss during that time, you can see quite clearly that within the luteal phase, there was an <coughs> effective constriction of the internal loss uh, at that moment. And of course, the mechanism by which that could take place, well, clearly, there is no neurologically driven sphincter at that point, but in recent years, there's been a very clear definition uh, of um, uh, the anatomy of the cervix and the internal loss in particular. This is a group from Columbia, um, uh, John Vink and, and colleagues, who used uh, pentachrome, which stained very nicely uh, on, on the left there, in red, the muscle, and uh, in yellow, the collagen. And what you can see is that at the internal loss, there is a predominance of muscular elements and relatively little collagen, whereas towards the external loss, you can see it's predominantly collagenous. And they indeed proposed a new paradigm for what was going on in the muscular arrangement within the uterus from, uh, and again, Susan, you're going to have to give the artistic license from some American graphics designer here, but uh, the, 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 the alignment of the myometrial fibers on the left there, but actually the suggestion that those same myometrial fibers may interact uh, and certainly appear to surround the upper part of the cervix close to the internals, which would be exactly where you'd want it to be if you wanted to preserve the longest closed length of the cervix. Um, we had the opportunity in Leeds to carry out MR studies, and so we obtained hysterectomy specimens and hemisected the cervix and put it in a small bore MR for two and a half days. And what we were able to do then through fibre tracking was to determine what these actually looked like. And here on the left, you see one of the hemisected specimens spinning round. And you can see quite clearly there the density of fibres and the circular arrangement of those fibres in the upper cervix, round where we would expect the internal loss to be. And in transverse sections on the right, again, you can see the, the encircling arrangement and the density of that arrangement close to the internal loss. And when we look at uh, the tract of volumes within uh, the proximal, middle, and distal elements of the cervix, you can quite clearly see here that there is a greater tract volume the higher up the cervix you get, closer to the internal loss, which we presume, or we would expect, performs that occlusive function. Now, just as we're very good at affecting the length of the cervix, we're also pretty good, I'm afraid, at uh, weakening the cervix too. Uh, and this is mainly through forced dilatation of the cervix, but also within our delivery suite practice. We are prone to damage the cervix also. Uh, here are the data uh, for the likelihood of uh, having a preterm birth after more than one termination of pregnancy, and you can see that the, the weighted uh, risk is much greater after one termination of pregnancy, uh, after more than one termination of What's interesting about these data is that um, the more recent studies, um, and in particular the ones where it's likely that misoprostol has been used as a ripening agent, as practice has changed, make this less likely. And if you look at medical termination of pregnancy, there is no association with preterm birth in subsequent pregnancies. So again, whether this is due to injury to the cervix as a consequence of forced dilatation. Is, is difficult to be certain, but it is an observation. And again, if you look at a variety of studies, prospective cohort, retrospective cohort, case controls uh, that involve dilatation of the cervix and dual risk of preterm birth, they all show their odds ratios are, are coming uh, to the right of unity. In other words, there is something about false dilatation of the cervix that is damaging one presumes the structure, the arrangement of those muscular fibers, and potentially compromising the strength and uh, the ability of the cervix uh, to 
than Taylor Prince. The most recent um, uh, element that we can identify is caesarean section, and in particular caesarean section towards the end of uh, uh, the, the first stage and the beginning of the second stage. So here we have, um, uh, so this if you think about the, the spontaneous <coughs> preterm birth rate and subsequent pregnancies, this, for this this will be 10%, 20%, 30%. And then you have what happened in the pregnancy before in terms of the stage of labor at which um, what stage of the labor cesarean was, was carried out, you can see that gradual increase in your chances of a preterm birth in a following pregnancy if you had a cesarean section. Uh, uh, and the chances are between probably 10 and 15 percent if the cesarean section is carried out in full dilatation. Um, we don't have comparable figures for operative vagina delivery. And although there are anecdotal reports that uh, incautious attempts at uh, heroic um, instrumental delivery may compromise the service, these data are fairly consistent across several cohorts for the risk uh, after full dilatation cesarean section. So this is a new concern for us, especially, of course, for two reasons. The, the chances of you having a cesarean section are greater now than they ever have been. And in some parts of the country, your chances of having a second stage section are even greater because of the reluctance or inability to carry out rotational operative delivery. But as I'm in Liverpool, I need not fear any worries on that score. Um, if you look at uh, uterus, and this is quite an extreme example, um, this is a, a hysterectomy specimen naturally showing where the trauma that's left after a caesarean section can lie. And you can see it's right at the junction, at the isthmus, with the cervix there. Um, and one can actually identify this on transvaginal scan. So here is the, the familiar shadow that uh, encroaches on the, uh, uh, on the lumen in, in the sagittal view. Uh, which is very characteristic of a C-section. Actually, this was a lady uh, of ours who had uh, an emergency section at nine centimeters at 39 weeks. Uh, she, in her next pregnancy, she lost a plug of mucus at 18 weeks uh, and then delivered three weeks later. And she came to see us because she wanted to know what her chances of a successful outcome later were. Um, we found this on a transvaginal scan, and then uh, there's a little bit more to it that I'm not, um, if, if you follow this little track up here, the, the radiologist kindly noticed these little uh, areas here as well, and noticed in subsequent scans that they connected with this. It was almost like there was, a, there was an extra sort of pouch, if you like, that was, that was located there. When we carried out an HSG on her, again you can see that the cavity, this is right at the first installation of dye, you can just see the outlines of the proximal elements of the fallopian tubes. This is the cavity here, but you can see this defect, this glaring defect right there within the cervix um, caused by that late dilatation C-section. Uh, and so that's her problem. Her problem is that her cervix is shot because of so, can we do something about any of this uh, to, to uh, offer women? And of course, the purpose of coming here today is to share our one and only success in obstetrics, and that is the placement of a circle arch. Uh, this is the ideal location because in placing it close to the isthmus, we have the ability to preserve the greatest cervical length by ensuring that there is reinforcement of the cervix at that, at that particular point. Now, who should we offer this to? Well, really, those who are at greatest risk of a mid-trimester delivery, because that's where you'll see the most profound consequences from prematurity. And we either do that on the basis of previous history, uh, history indicated or elective or planned cerclage, uh, 
or we'll do it on the basis of ultrasound findings within the second trimester which indicate that the internal loss is collapsing and it is likely to be progressive. So an ultrasound indicated subclavage. And then lastly, we will uh, on occasion place a, a stitch where the membranes are actually visible. That process of weakness has got to the point where the membranes are actually visible or indeed are protruding through into the upper vagina. And that would be an emergency or physician indicated subclavage if you were in the States. Um, how do, we, how do we assess the cervix? Well, traditionally, and certainly with the continental practice, this has been by digital examination, um, where you can see in most of these countries, apart from uh, well, Spain and Holland and ourselves, uh, it is quite normal for a digital examination at regular, uh, at, um, uh, at regular uh, intervals within pregnancy, because the feeling then is that the, the physician can feel how soft or how open the cervix is and judge on that basis whether a suture would be helpful. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have any benefit. Again, the randomized trials of its use uh, make no difference to the woman's likelihood of delivering preterm, but it does increase the chance of her admission to hospital for rest or other interventions. So it seems like digital examination really isn't the way to go forward. Uh, and it really wasn't until, again, technology through uh, the, the um, development of transvaginal probes in the late 80s offered the opportunity for us to, in a, uh, a more reliable fashion, check the cervix. The technique is now well established, and if you go to clear.perinatalquality.org or you go to the Fetal, Foundation, uh, Fetal Medicine Foundation website, you will have very nice descriptions and sort of PowerPoints on how to carry out a transvaginal scan. But these are the key elements that one would want within every image that one produced in order to most completely assess the cervix and internal loss. And then we come back to this uh, uh, picture here. You want a clear view of the, the cervix without any bladder, without you compressing the anterior lip of the cervix, with a clear view of the lower segment and where the internal and external os is. And the only thing you really want to hear, when you, or you want to document when you've done your scan, is the length of closed cervix and the appearance of the internal os. That's really all that matters. Because if the internal loss starts to give way, uh, and these are some biomechanical modeling of the, the, the cervix and the membranes uh, and their interrelationship, and you start to see either increased pressures and a di diminished strength within the upper cervix, you see varying degrees of protrusion of the forebag down the cervical canal. Uh, and that is realized on a transvaginal scan. That was the same lady we saw earlier. This was four weeks on uh, when we scanned her again. You can quite clearly see, this is the head on the left here. The pressure of the head and the conceptors has revealed collapse of the internal loss. And you can just see that collapse and very elegantly demonstrated there. And with consequent shortening of the closed length of the cervix. And of course, if that is uh, run beneath that 20 mm mark, you are in trouble. And the cervix can give way in lots of spectacular and unspectacular ways. Um, there used to be a lot of precedence set on uh, whether it was V-shape, U-shape, Y-shape, which I think was just somebody demonstrating that they knew the alphabet more than any um, truly uh, clinically beneficial way. Um, the one thing that is clear is that uh, anything that compromises the internal loss will shorten that overall closed length. And the other feature that you can see here, within that prolapsed finger of, of, of membrane going down the cervical canal, is that you can see this element here, which is rather unflatteringly called sludge or debris, which refers to the sort of the death match that's going on between microbes and white cells within the amniotic cavity at that point, indicating 
that there is microbial ingress and uh, a degree of host response. Sometimes when you scan the cells, you do have to wait about half a minute or so before it to reveal itself, and even then, you may well have to put some suprapubic pressure to just increase the pressure slightly in the uterus to reveal things. So if we look at this, uh, so here's, here is the, the, the head and the lower pole of the uterus, this is the cervix, and you can see on the face of it, it's, it looks pretty much okay. But just watch what happens when we, we increase the pressure on the uterus. You can see the amniotic fluid spilling into that prolapsed bit of the, um, that, that prolapsed element there. And what it's caused is, uh, as I say, the revelation of that prolapsed part of the forebank and that pool of data there which we can see clearly there, and we can see the overall length of the closed cervix is only 23 millimeters. So that's the cervix that's in trouble, but we might have missed it if we hadn't waited, if we hadn't put some superpuber pressure on there. The second uh, situation on which I feel it is beneficial to scan the cervix is after you put your cerclage in. Now you might say, well, if a cerclage is there, then surely there can't be any problem. But unfortunately, as this um, shows us, it, it can be a problem. And you can see here, there is one part of the circlage, there is the other part of the circlage, it's sort of coming out of the, this is a sagittal view, it's coming out of the screen back in. You can see that the, the forebag has uh, herniated within that circlage because it simply isn't tight enough. And so what's happened is it's simply herniated within the circlage, uh, and that required revision. And I'm pleased to say that she that it was able to extend her pregnancy uh, to uh, 38 weeks. Uh, the other situation where you might consider imaging the cervix, but you would not use a transvaginal scan, is the moment when you're called to triage uh, by one of the team to say that this woman is 20 weeks, she's had some mucus loss, and I've examined her, and she looks fully dilated. And that is, of course, the hourglass membranes, because when one conducts, say, a speculum examination, all you will see is that hourglass part of the membrane. In which case, the simplest thing is not to do a TB scan, just to do a transabdominal scan with a full bladder. And what you see here, the bladder provides a beautiful acoustic window to see how the, the collapse <coughs> of the cervix has allowed this herniated this herniated portion here within the upper vagina. You can also notice there um, the, the debris there that's indicating microbial activity there already. This forebag here is three centimeters in diameter. Um, but actually, what's encouraging is that the internal loss is only over by about 13 millimeters. So it's likely that there is some functional cervix there for you to to proceed to attempt to reinforce after having replaced the membranes back in the back of the uterus. Okay, how do we carry this out? Well, there are two main approaches. Um, there is either the placement of a reinforcing suture around the vaginal portion of the cervix or around the supravaginal portion. Now, the vaginal portion is more appealing because that's the 20 millimeters or so that one can see on a speculum exam. But of course, there's still another 20 millimeters or so of cervix that is hidden from view, that is supravaginal. And um, one would, I suppose, um, uh, 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 then say, well, where did all these come from? And we, we call them really after the, the guys who described them first of all, McDonald and Scirocco. Uh, and Benson and Durfee is a bit too long, so we just call it a transabdominal instead. They, 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 didn't get there. they didn't decide who was going to get there first. But um, the description of these were all about 50 or 60 years ago. Uh, this was MacDonald's recollection of, MacDonald was an Australian who came over to the UK, tried out all his experiments on British women, and then went back to make his fortune in Melbourne. Um, and rather beautifully describes when he was a registrar. Can you imagine your registrar trying this now? Uh, 
register on the North Mid, this is, I am age 35, he's admitting all the story is there. Uh, and what he found was that at 24 weeks, she complained of a backache, a bearing down discomfort, and a mucus discharge. And the examination revealed um, that the cervix was dilated to two fingers, and the memories were bulging through the external. So what would you do in that situation? Well, he was obviously at the loose end. Maybe his bosses didn't bother to come to delivery suite anymore. So what he did is he just put some chromic cat gut around the cervix. And then what I also love is that she came back um, later, uh, and of course the chromic had dissolved by then, so he just did it again, and again, and again. And got her, uh, I can't remember how far, far on he got her, but he got her to vibe a little. And he thought, well that's interesting. Uh, maybe uh, that's something which will help support a weak cervix. And uh, when we carry out McDonald's, I think this is the other great tragedy, is that when I started obstetrics, the cerclage was always placed at the end of the list, and it was given to the most junior doctor to do. Yes, that was, that was the deal. It was the way you cut your teeth, if you like, uh, in obstetrics, was being let loose on the cervix to put your McDonald's stitch in. Um, but actually, you need, and actually there's the other thing, everyone else bombed off to the coffee room, including sister, and you're left with this in these instruments and left to get on with it. But in order to do these optimally, you need a scrub nurse and you need an assistant because you want to retract the, the vagina effectively, you want to stabilize the cervix in order so that you might put that stitch in in its greatest possible uh, way. And you want to get as high up on the cervix as you can. This is from a wonderful website called atlasofpelvicsurgery.com. Uh, which shows how the McDonald is placed. And you can see one deliberately takes a bite of the stroma around, as, as I say, as high up the vaginal cervix as you dare, without <coughs> hopefully uh, embarrassing the bladder or the chap at the back. And that is the net result. Obviously, the technique here is to close it at 6 o'clock. Other methods will, or other practitioners will use 12 o'clock. Uh, and the cross-section over there shows what's been accomplished. That purse string has effectively helped reinforce the cervix at that level. A Sharodka suture, technically speaking, is, is quite different. A Sharodka suture is actually designed to be placed around the supravaginal cervix. And it is probably reasonable to adopt that approach if a McDonald suture has failed in the past, or indeed the portio, the vaginal portion of the cervix, is sufficiently uh, damaged or deficient that it wouldn't be sensible to do so. And Chirocca described his operation in the snappily entitled journal, which I unfolded probably shortly afterwards, called Antiseptic. Uh, back in 1955, he'd been doing it for several years in Bombay, uh, and he rather wonderfully described how he would obtain fascia lata from the patient's thigh. Uh, as she was obviously up in the thotomy, you just get some fascia lata from the thigh. And then he used a strip of that to encircle the cervix. And in order to do that, we again need our assistant and our scrub nurse. And the instruments that you will find helpful are a Vienna to retract the anterior donor wall, again, the little woods to stabilize the cervix, a 10 blade scalpel and some curved scissors in order to divide the cervical uh, uterine, uh, cervical cycle fascia, and in order to push the bladder out of the way, and use atraumatic tissue forceps, the Babcocks, in order to grasp the cervix either side so that you can pass your suture close to the internal loss and through, hopefully, elements of the cardinal or uterocentral and so for this one, again, within Atlas of Darwin Surgery, you can see that once carried out, the anterior corpotomy, you mobilize the bladder in the midline, not the bladder pillars, unless you want to be there several hours later, cauterizing things. So just mobilize in the midline. You do the same posteriorly to get into the posterior, uh, into the patch of Douglas. And in, in Shirotka's day, what he, he did is he used swingers, um, aneurysm needles, 
in order to pull through his um, fascia lata, but we now, of course, have mercidine sutures or the monofilament sutures with, with fitted ends. And then, having tied it, uh, you can see that the cervix is now occluded, or at least reinforced by uh, a suture much higher up in the cervix, closer to the internals. And in our modification, we will tie at 12 o'clock and we'll bring one end of the suture out through the anterior compotomy so that there's a chance of the registrar finding it at 4 o'clock in the morning if she comes at pre-term labour. And uh, then sewing up the compotomies and the resulting reinforcement is affected at a much higher level. And that, of course, we feel will preserve a much longer length of closed cervix. And after the procedure, this is what one would normally see on a transvaginal scan. You can see that the, um, the, the mercedine tape is glimpsed very close to the, the internal loss. And that, of course, means that if the cervix is indeed weak, it will not progress beyond your reinforcing suture and you've preserved a much longer length of closed cervix. Um, if you want to uh, do this transabdominally, uh, this can either be done preconceptually or during pregnancy, but really beyond 14 weeks it starts to get a bit sweaty because you have to mobilize, you have to deliver the uterus in order to place the suture. Uh, you'll need a balfour retractor, a pack, and some long instruments for most of our ladies in order to approach uh, the, the uterus. And then it's relatively simple. You, you will mobilize the uterus in the cycle fold, again just in the midline, and then you will pass, again, he's using a blunt angled uh, forceps here, but again, we'll just pass the needle medial to um, the uterine arteries and uh, the ureters. And again, in this caption, we have the, the knot being tied anteriorly. Again, I think probably most people will tie their knots, certainly in an open technique, posteriorly. And of course, some of our colleagues have the abilities to offer laparoscopic um, uh, circlage as well, but there is less known about that uh, and its relative um, efficacy. At the end of the day, um, one can see that the, the position of the suture uh, is again near the isthmus, that narrowest fit of the, uh, of, of the cervix. And the virtue of having it at the isthmus is that it cannot slip off from there. Usually you've You've, you've got a bit of ligament in with that to hold it firm, but also you've tied it at a location where it just can't slip off. Whereas the McDonald's suture uh, is tied around a greater circumference and therefore has the greater opportunity of both slipping off and being relatively less effective. And is supplage effective? Well, yes it is. Uh, and this is just one example of, of several studies which uh, uh, through their Kaplan Meyer, um, indicate the benefit of surplage, leading to a reduction of spontaneous preterm birth by about a third. And that figure is, is largely replicated in those studies. This was a, um, a, a North American study, uh, Vincent Bogler, John Owen, but it was a multi center study. Um, but if you want to look at the, obviously, if you want to go for the real truth, you come to the Cochrane reviews. And Nancy Medley's review uh, on the top there uh, identified Zarco's review as really showing that your chances of reducing preterm birth are indeed uh, very effective uh, by about 20 23%. What's interesting though, and what brings us back to all our other achievements, is well, actually, does it make any difference? Do you really make it? Does it really solve all your problems? And there's a qualified plus there in yellow, which means that, yes, there is a trend in that direction, but as you can see, um, if you look at perinatal death, the risk ratio is actually, um, uh, although it looks good, it crosses unity, the confidence intervals cross unity. So, maybe, I don't know, again, we come back to this feature, what might one achieve? Well, ideally, we want to be examining all these babies at the age of 10 to see what their chances of motor disability or cognitive decline or of socialization disorder 
is actually what's that outcome? Because that's the really important one, rather than this. But I suspect that we would find benefit there. But what are the problems you say? Well, if, if this is also marvelous, Nigel, why, why, you know, why aren't we seeing much bigger benefit towards its use? And I think it's illustrated in the sort of patients that are admitted to the <coughs> studies that uh, Jaco and uh, his colleagues were looking at. And I think it's exemplified by the, one of the largest trials that was done, which was the MRC, uh, RCOG study in the early 90s. Nothing like this had been done before. But you'll notice within the abstract there that the subjects who were approached were women whose obstetricians were uncertain whether to recommend cervical surgery. In other words, these weren't women in whom the obstetricians knew they needed it or felt they needed it. These are women who were of relatively lower risk. Um, and, uh, as I say, not all of them had had a history of early delivery or cervical surgery. Uh, and, of course, we didn't have transvaginal scans in those days. Now, what's interesting about the study was it was indeed very much a nearly 30 month women. But about a quarter hadn't had a previous mid-trimester or a pre -term. The median insertion of the suture was relatively late, because if you'll remember, this is actually where things are starting potentially to get a bit shaky with the cervix. The clinicians who took part had a wide range of practice. Some didn't do supply, hadn't done supply at all. Others were doing 50 per thousand pregnancies. That's one every 20 women. So there was quite a wide, I mean, this was real world practice, I suppose. And what was uh, found in the pre-specified uh, approach was that your chance of a, a delivery under 33 weeks was reduced significantly from 17 to 13%, but your chances of preterm birth under 37 weeks were, uh, were not, did not reach significance. And therefore, that came out with the number that we've all been told about since then, that the number needed to treat, you need to put 25 stitches in to prevent one preterm birth. And that doesn't sound like a very fair equation to me, considering what we described about it. So probably the issues for us going forward are, are threefold. How can we better identify the patients who will need or benefit, potentially benefit from the stitch? And who can we best include in our studies in the future? Well, We've talked about cervical scanning in the second trimester. That is certainly a useful way of going about it. But is there a way of doing that before pregnancy? Well, there, there disappointingly haven't been any large trials or studies, but there are ways in which one can check the strength of the cervix or the amount of force required to dilate the cervix up to Hagar 8. Uh, this is George Anthony's group, and I think Liverpool and Leeds are the only English centres where these um, this apparatus still resides. I think Jimmy Walker pinched it and brought it to Leeds. It's a bit like the stone of scone, you know, um, or, the, or the, the Greek marbles, you know. Um, but this is the, the instrument that's used, and if you look at a group of women who delivered in the trimester in yellow, you see they have a much lower cervical resistance index than their sisters who have delivered at term. So maybe this is one way of ascertaining whether women have a weak cervix or not. The second approach, um, the second element is should we be doing more chirurgical sutures? Should we be aiming to get the suture as high up as possible? Uh, well, let's have a look. Well, this is uh, again a retrospective study from the States, from Vincent Burglar's group, and what they looked at was the, su uh, um, was the, the length of the cervix after the circular that would be in place, and the overall outcomes of those pregnancies. And you can see here that if the, um, the surplage length was less than 17 millimeters, you had a 30% chance of delivering preterm. If you got your uh, post-surplage length longer than that, there was a lower, much lower risk of delivering preterm. This was studied much further, but again in a retrospective sense from the two big units who do surplage in London, Imperial and St. Thomas's. They studied 179 women who had ultrasound indicated supply for a short cervix. 
uh, and they measured the distance from the cerclage position to the external ones. And what was interesting was that the range varied quite a lot between 2 and 28 millimetres. What they noticed was that if the suture was in the distal portion of the cervix, your chances of a preterm were, were much greater. 38% as opposed to 90%, or 55% as opposed to 27%. So there did appear to be something about having a suture higher up the cervix as an indicator that you were likely to have a successful outcome. Again, if you look at other observational studies, here are our data from Leeds, looking at what the outcomes are from the placement of an elective Shirovka or Donald, and the blue bars indicate success, delivery before or after 34 weeks, and the red uh, elements uh, denote miscarriage or very neonatal death or stillbirth took place. So you can see that the Shirovka panel on the left has a much higher success rate uh, in gestational terms uh, than the McDonald uh, or the transabdominal. The transabdominal are a bit unfair because of course they're taking on the, the, the more difficult uh, clients. Um, if you look at ultrasound indicated again, your chances of having a successful outcome from a Shirodka procedure were much higher than if a McDonald procedure had been used. So I think there is some data to suggest that a suture height does matter. And we perhaps ought to rediscover the techniques of using a Shirodka approach. The next thing is the suture material. Again, what suture material should we use? This was actually prompted by a survey of UK obstetricians <coughs> by team from Birmingham and Cambridge, um, curiously enough led by, uh, well, incorporating urogynecologists. Um, now they sampled two, well they sampled lots of obstetricians, 261, one presumes the ones who knew what they were talking about sent their replies back. Uh, the majority carry out abdominal sutures, uh, interestingly three quarters carrying out less than 20 uh, um, procedures a year. What they noticed was that there were some heretics who were not using braided sutures, yes? And they thought, well, that's really interesting. And so they went a little bit further and they said, so, well, what are the outcomes from the braided and the non-braided, the monofilament sutures? And they found to their surprise that the use of monofilament suture was, a, was linked with a much higher success rate in terms of extending gestational length. Uh, and then some of the... Well, to the urogynecologist, this was no surprise because, of course, braided material in the vagina is, as we all know from the mesh control study, a real source of concern because of the, its tendency to be colonized by microbes. So what they did, then did was uh, stimulated uh, the team at Imperial to do another retrospective study, this time of women who had undergone um, colonization and then who required ultrasound indicated circlage, uh, and they again found to their surprise the numbers were reasonably, um, were reasonable numbers. Uh, what they found was that the monofilament suture, although the success rate was similar in both arms, if you had a monofilament suture place, you were much less likely to deliver protein. So there are some legs in this argument, and I'm pleased to say that it will be answered I'm not going to say in the near future, but it will be answered when we finish C stage, which is a large randomized multi center study of elective or, uh, uh, on elective or ultrasound indicated sutures who are randomized to either braided or monofilament with the primary outcome of pregnancy loss. And once we've assembled 2,100 women, we will have the answer, I hope, uh, as to what suture material is best. Whether it will answer other questions which um, relate to the ease of removal or insertion uh, or the tendency to migrate, um, I'm not quite sure because those are all the secondary outcomes. Uh, but at the moment we're up to about 1,200 women. Um, lastly, are there any uh, alternatives or indeed adjuncts? And we're thinking about progesterone and pessaries. now. The progesterone story has been rumbling along since the 1930s, so it's unlikely to be, the chapter is unlikely to be closed any time soon. But it's, it's uncertain as to which women will benefit, when they should have it, and um, uh, 
how it should be delivered, whether it should be plain progesterone or hydroxy progesterone or caproid. We just don't know. What we do know is that there is probable benefit to some women, but for the majority of women, and more importantly in their babies, there does not appear to be a, a huge reason to crack out the progesterone. This is the largest study that's been done in this country, the optimal trial, which looked at women at high risk and, and gave either vaginal pessaries or placebo and found no change in that primary measure of preterm birth. Although interestingly, there were in the secondary outcomes significant reductions in neonatal death uh, and abnormal cranial ultrasound, which is interesting in itself, but not statistically uh, significant. Um, so, uh, what about using progesterone in addition to um, uh, 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 a surplage? Because if the surplage can fix the, the reinforce the cells, or maybe progesterone will have a di additive benefit in perhaps it, um, uh, altering the tenacity of the uh, of the plug or altering somehow the immunity of the woman. Um, so here in a secondary but pre-specified analysis of the vagina upside and surplus trial, which you saw the, uh, the the primary outcomes before, they noticed there were four groups who shook out of that: those who did not have anything, those who had the surplus, those who would, had been on 17 p That's caproid test of progesterone, and those women who had had both cyclage and progesterone. And what they found was uh, that there was a significant reduction, a, a trend I should say, towards early delivery, mid-trimester delivery in the women who had cyclage versus those who were given cyclage and progesterone. That ability tended to weaken the further on in pregnancy. It was further reinforced by another study. This is another. Um, uh, this was a retrospective study, so less sort of uh, less weight to that. But in this retrospective study, again, good numbers over 250 women incorporating both elective and ultrasound indicated supplies. What they found here was that there was not work very well. A significant reduction in your chances of a very preterm birth in those women who were given progesterone in addition to their social So I think there is something here as well. There is evidence that uh, adjunctive use of progesterone may well benefit the women in whom we place a supplage. And another recent study in Australia looking at those who had a supplage with progesterone, those who just had the supplage alone. Again, there's a capital and uh, small numbers, and of course, um, one also always has to be slightly concerned about the retrospective nature, but again, suggesting possibly some benefit. Uh, and then lastly, will the pessary supersede um, the circulage? Well, I think the jury is still very much out on that. Uh, there's no question it's an easier uh, and less morbid uh, procedure for the mothers to undergo, both in its insertion and removal. Um, I think all I can say at the moment is that uh, the study of Liverpool recap was not showing any significant difference when it was placed against surplage or progesterone, which was encouraging. Um, the study that is uh, ongoing and which we're all contributing to now support, which is based on St Thomas's, will give us the definitive answer on that as to which of the three modalities is going to be useful. So in summary, I, I, I hope that I've been able to, um, to throw some light on the importance of the cervix and the maintenance of the cervical barrier as being key to prolonging pregnancy. I hope I've provided some data about supplies to persuade you that it's safe and effective. But there is lots of work to be done on this. Both the selection of women who would be best served by a surplus, the route by which we place it, and the alternative options that may be open us because they still remain contentious. Thank you very much. Have a drink. I think everyone's deserved a drink. <laughs> right, okay. So.
folks, we have got, you have got 15 minutes for questions, because we have an important meeting at 6 o'clock in the restaurant downtown. So, because we need to treat our guests well. So, any questions for Nigel? Do you think the increase in the Tambas is still very Really reflects the society rather than what we do as obstetricians. And I don't know. Yeah, um, because it, it's very, it's dropping. Yeah, that's right. It just seemed to, uh, to rise. No, no, that's, that's quite right. Our, our local rates have done exactly the same uh, since 2009 was about the best year, uh, and you're quite right. The, the rates of business and so it's tempting to ascribe it to austerity because, of course, our interventions haven't changed largely. And the one thing that has changed is the inequality in this country. So uh, I suspect that is very possibly a reflection on societal forces, which again must humble us when we when we clap ourselves on the back uh, in terms of the care that we give. Um, uh, unfortunately, we, 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 well, unless if you've got a good idea for what we can use, well, to, to you, you, you are such glass half empty people. Why, why can't you say that? Can you imagine how much more it would, how much worse it would be if, it, didn't if it wasn't for fantastic obstetricians that we are trying to give them a bit down. So they have risen less than they would have otherwise. Um, anyway. What's interesting is that probably there is value in continuity of carer in reducing preterm birth. Yes. yes. And that almost certainly is mediated through that relationship and the value which women put into it and see themselves, that lens they see themselves through um, as a potent sort of force for preventing preterm birth. So um, I think we, there are lots of ways in which we can do to try and combat uh, societal pressures on women and those causes of preterm birth. Yes. Yeah. Um, I imagine completely, and I suspect it's very deliberate, not mention the vaginal microbiome. I Any think, comments? I think that history is still being written. Um, I, again, I, I don't fully understand it. Um, although, one of the features, and you're quite right here, I did not mention that in that slide, one of the features that the group from the period noticed was that um, their paper was actually about the vaginal microbiome during pregnancy. And what they noticed was that the vaginal microbiome exhibited abnormal community states um, uh, in situations where preterm birth was more likely. What they noticed in their surplage group was that the women who had the braided sutures exhibited those abnormal community states in the vagina, and the monofilament group did not. And so the, the supposition was that um, that was one reason potentially why the monofilament group uh, did better, if you know. Um, the whole landscape of the microbiome and host defense mechanisms, especially the you know, elephin and other defenses within the cervical mucus, is, is still under study, I think it's fair to say. But it's I'm only presenting the, the, the 2018 um, lecture, okay, where I'm just summarizing how things are, and I'm gazing dimly into the future, but I'm, I'm sure one of the bright trainees here will in another 10 years have all the answers about defenses and how we're manipulating, if you like, host response to these ascending microbes in a way that may supplant our use of uh, our central knowledge. I guess... I would just add a comment that probably currently the biggest discrepancy between science and our clinical practice is probably in the vaginal microbiome, where all the research and, and, and science is talking about a DNA analysis or RNA analysis when we are talking about community trade, whereas clinically if you're going to do anything, you're just swabbing vagina and looking for bacterial vaginosis. And just for those of you who are still swabbing and chasing bacterial vaginosis, please do read a recent Lancet paper on 
study from France that has finally been reported where they have 50,000 women with asymptomatic women with screened for bacterial vaginosis. 5,000 women with bacterial vaginosis were randomized for clean, between clindamycin and placebo. Preterm birth in the clindamycin group was 1.2%. Preterm birth in, in placebo group was 1%. I'm not going to agree. Well, there's more to that study as well, but, so we can both talk about it. But we can talk about it later. Uh, Joe. Right. Um, I've, I've had an interest in this for years and years and years. Um, what I wonder is whether we are now very reluctant to put in elective surclages, which are technically <laughs> not that difficult to do if you train to do them, and are definitely so much easier than putting up one on the end of your list after she's been to the preterm labour clinic and the cervix is short from 34 to 20 millimetres. And also then, it, by definition, however good McDonald's suit you put in, you're not going to leave yes. what, according to your statistics, is a reasonable enough length of cervix to get the effect that we're trying to do. And I think this all goes back to the, MRC, the RCOG study, because we used to put in far more cerclages in those days um, than we do now, because the statistics didn't support putting in cerclages. But Jacques's paper quite clearly said that they recruited people into it that really should never have had one in the first place. So have we gone a little bit too, sorry Jacques, too evidence-based in that you need physical evidence that that cervix is shortening, rather than going back to old-fashioned history taking and taking a punt. I think we've lost a valuable surgical skill. Yeah. And I think that's one of the problems, that we, we don't have a community of obstetricians who are familiar with vaginal yeah. surgery. Yeah. And, and so the notion of the now anterior and posterior colpotomy yeah. is, is quite, quite threatening. Um, and you do need to do that to get the, that reinforcing suture high enough up. Um, and I think well, I, possibly the MRC study did have an impact. It did put a downer on the uh, in that respect. But I, I don't think I was practicing long enough before then to sort of have a real feel of the, the zitgeist before and after that study. But I could imagine that people would look at the NMT and say, my goodness, we're putting in far too many. And I mean, I'm sure there probably were people who were un operating unnecessarily. So going down that route, should we be getting our... Should we as obstetricians be doing it? Or should we well, be getting our vaginal surgeons to do it? I don't want any gynaecologist in my delivery suite. You know, because who's going to look after these women after? Oh yeah, I, I know oh, that, yeah. but I mean, we're, we're quite happy for gynaecologists to put in our laparoscopic TACs and I wouldn't expect anybody here to be learning how to do a laparoscopic transabdominal cerclage just because it's a vaginal operation. Why should we be able to do that when we put everything else over to gynaecologists? I, 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 I appreciate that. I, I think this is, not, this is not an overly difficult technique. Um, if you are carrying, say, 20 or 30 or 40 of these operations a year, you will maintain those skills. What I think is wrong is, is teaching somebody this and expecting them to do it five times a year. That, would be, that wouldn't be helpful. I suspect what we're going to see is more of these surclages being done in more specialist centres or maybe one person, one or two people in each unit doing them because that's what we would expect from, say, vert tunnels, for example. Um, we, we would expect that sort of approach to be taken. In. So I think, but we have regionalized. We have regionalized a lot of obstetric procedures, like you know, prenatal diagnosis no, and, and in utero transfer. So I, I, yeah. I don't understand why why would cervical cyclage be any different in that be, Because of the availability of the person to do it when it needs doing. If you're going to use the model of doing it on cervical shortening. Be, I mean, I know because I, I used to be on delivery suite on a Wednesday after he did a street turn later for the number of phone calls 
in a new yeah, election doing it. It's <laughs> so it, 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 it is slightly different from a planned elective procedure, how especially many, how if you're going to book it in. do you do with new weeds? Uh, of our own home group, about one in 200 weeds. So we do about um, 50 or 60 of our own, yeah. and another 20, 30. Yeah. You know, so you're talking about less than 100. We are going to do here 20 or 30 or 10. So basically what you're talking about, you need three people to do that. If you were to proper, if you say that, that if we say that we need to do 20 or 30 in, a, in, a, in order to actually help maintain the skills that kids are doing, that e even in a huge centers like ours, you, you, are, you are not needing more than two or three people plus one or two to be trained. And I think that this is absolutely the way forward. Particularly if you are going to go down to Shirotka Road, because if you are talking about going into the, because the <coughs> fundamental difference here is with the Shirotka, you are going into abdominal cavity. Yep. Yeah. And that is the key question. I mean, Shirotka and McDonald, it's all the da 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 da. You know, what is the difference? You know, to my mind, that's how I describe it. You either go into abdominal cavity or you don't. That is, that is the difference. And when you start going into abdominal cavity in a pregnant woman, you are talking about this is a proper switch. Well, it's suddenly scary. Yes. So, therefore, therefore this needs to be, that, this needs to be, people need to be adequately trained skill needs to be maintained and therefore this needs to be appropriately catered for in terms of training and the sort of idea that cervical class should be done by every trainee, which I think is in the logbook, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this is a joke. It is absolutely a joke. In a transvaginal ultrasound, oh no, you can you need three years of training and you you are, this is not a basic skill that selects you to do the thing that everybody can do. It's just a joke. But if you have a vast majority of, of obstetric or vast majority of consultants, both of and Ghani, who will never have done a vaginal distraction. Nor should they. And that's oh, the skill that you need. We used yeah. to really old fashioned days we used to do Manchester repairs, we just locked the cervix up and carried it on a lot. But we were very used to doing vaginal surgery. You will have a whole host of people. So I don't see, I mean, it, it, I, I see what you're talking about, but if you're looking at something going forward and building something that's going to be sustainable long term, you have to involve your gynecology colleagues in developing the process. I guess I just want to make a comment that sort of feeds onto what Joe said and what you said earlier on, Nigel, about um, the disappointment that rates have been increasing in preterm birth. But we may be that this is a, a picture as of a few years ago because. We've just recently done a survey where Shang Harris will have published in the B job soon, um, where now a third of units in the country have a preterm labour clinic. Mm -hmm. And just canvassing our own region in Cheshire and it's about 75% of units actually have a preterm labour clinic of some description and obviously not all yes. identical. And I think we've talked about it, most of those are doing saclage as their primary treatment, as we have known for a long time. This idea of skill base, I think, and this idea of regionalisation of things. That all feeds into this hub and spoke, which actually is probably already mostly there. We just haven't tapped into it. Yes. And we're, those of us who work in large units aren't actually necessarily communicating brilliantly yet with the units that are setting up. Got the preterm birth network and all those sorts of things, which is helpful, but maybe we need to start this conversation about increasing skills and centralizing certain aspects of the care. I think two things will help. Uh, one, saving babies' lives. This the, the next version will have reduction of preterm birth as one of the elements and will mandate use of transvaginal standards. Mm -hmm. So that will happen in every unit. So there'll be a need for the liaison about what to do with this, what to do with that. Mm -hmm. The second driver will be the local maternity systems, which again will be encouraged to have mm -hmm. a network of uh, appropriately provided for pathways within each LMS or adjacent to each other that's to cater for these women. But I, th I think we've been sleepwalking with preterm birth. I mean, the rates are eight percent. You know that, that if it was anything else, there'd be an outcry. But we just don't. We trivialise preterm birth as not being terribly exciting. But you can see <coughs> the long-term consequences from the epidemiological study. Professor Weeks has an honour to ask the last question. <laughs> Thank you. It was a brilliant talk, Nigel. Um, you, you talked uh, earlier on about how, despite total lysis delaying uh, delivery, the lack of effect on perinatal mortality. 
Um, and you, came a little, you became a little bit more coy about it when you were talking about surplage um, uh, and, um, uh, and when you were spend, uh, extending the benefits of that. Um, and I wonder whether we're missing a trick by failing to personalize our treatment of preterm births in that we, uh, we assume that they are all going to cause benefit uh, and we tend to treat them similarly, uh, the threatened preterm birth, uh, and whether there's uh, actually, we, by uh, selecting our cases more carefully, uh, we could find some benefit on uh, mortality, which we don't see at the moment. I think that's a very good point. You know, um, surplage will only help women with a weak cervix. Yes. It's not going to stop somebody whose cervix is weakening because it's being told to open up by departures and forces. Um, it will help somebody whose cervix has, if you like, collapsed under the weight of the conceptors. That's, that's, that, well, what, if you're going to say, that's the group I want to do it in. And we, at the moment, we have a, a screening tool, transvaginal sonography, which can't discriminate between those two parts. So I think, you know, there are situations where we'll put a stitch in and actually, parturition is happening uh, and we may unnecessarily prolong pregnancy to the potential detriment of the baby, but we'll feel we've done jolly well because we bought, you know, X number of weeks. Um, and uh, you're right, we are, we are missing a trick in not following these, these children up into, you know, uh, beyond infancy, into school age, so we can actually sort of see what is the impact of these interventions on what are from a societal and a personal point of view, more important outcomes. That's the that's, that's trend. I was hoping for more of the upbeat uh, <laughs> message <laughs> to finish off, but <laughs> there, there we go. Sorry, I got on. Oh, go on, the last one. You always have to need to have the last word, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. I know historically we've been talking about the uterine abnormalities and preterm labor but we've never actually included them in our surveillance cohort. Now that we're having more and more surgeries on these uterine abnormalities, which is similar to what we are talking about, the cesarean section and full annotation and cesarean section, should we be including these women in our surveillance? And what is your opinion on that? So women with malaria and variants, yes? Yes, I do. If you look at women with malaria and variants, most of the meta-analyses do indicate a 30 to 40 percent chance of full surgery. I suppose that's not surprising because although our eyes are always taken to the, the wonderful variations in the uterine anatomy, because of course the paramecium nephric ducts contribute to both the corpus and the cervix and upper vagina, it's not surprising that cervical function and integrity will be compromised as well. So yes, the reasons why these women will deliver early in part may be due to capacity issues, in part maybe due to placentation on, if you like, the collagenous partitions, but also maybe because of survival weakness. And I think anecdotally we would certainly feel that those women with malaria variants or who have been found on an early pregnancy scan to have a bicornuate uterus ought to have, say, scans at 16 and 22 weeks just to assess the cervix of those critical moments. And is that what you are doing on your unit? We do that in all ages. And until what gestation do you follow them up? Because the preterm uh, usually 26. No, at 22 weeks, if the cervix is exactly the same, we'll send them that because their chances of a significantly preterm birth are very low. Um, of course, you're going to follow them later on for small for gestational age and malposition, um, malpresentation. <coughs> you will be following them up then as well, but you won't. I don't think. Well, don't personally think there's much benefit in scanning the cervix because you, you can't do anything to retrieve the situation if you find a soft, short cervix of 30 weeks. You're not going to do anything. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, hopefully you have enjoyed it. And uh, thank you, Nigel.